بحاول ده All right. Well, welcome everybody to another session of the Library of Things collab. Today's topic is going to be focused on um, complementary programming on on classes and workshops and other educational opportunities uh, to be able to dive into um, to build upon libraries of things and also can be used to as a way to seed them. That was one way that we got started when we were starting the Asphalt Tool Library in North Carolina is that we started hosting workshops and classes uh, in different spaces around the city to engage folks in the process uh, to be part of the library of things, uh, part of the tool library. So um, excited for today's session. We have two presenters with us today. We've got Jen Kim coming up, coming to us from um, Baltimore. And uh, we've got Barrett. Uh, is it I, I forgot to actually ask you how to pronounce your last name, Barrett. It's ID. Yeah, ID. So we got Barrett ID coming to us from Seattle. And, um, you know, as always, uh, these sessions are recorded. We're going to be posting them to uh, Canvas um, later in the week. The transcripts are up there as well. Um, we're also saving the chat because the chat is such a rich space during these sessions. So we do encourage you to, you know, as questions come up, as, as things are mentioned, uh, as you have experiences in, in your own work related to what's talked, uh, please do feel free to, to put in the chat. We're grabbing all that stuff. And then one thing we haven't talked a lot about is that now that we're getting towards the end of the collab, we're going to be taking all of these recordings, all of the resources and building out a very, very ro robust toolbox of resources uh, for, you know, all the different things you might need for starting a library of things. Um, and so we'll be pulling all this stuff together that we've learned during these sessions and editing all of all of these hour long uh, presentations and uh, down to bite sizable chunks and chapters. Uh, and that will all be available uh, by the end of the summer, um, in addition to the resources being remaining being available up on Canvas. So uh, without further ado, again, oh, last things, we're going to be doing a Q. There's going to be time for questions at the end. We're also going to be sticking around for another 15 minutes uh, over time um, for those that want to hang out. Um, and if you've got any questions uh, about the collab in general, uh, please do feel free to reach out to Candice, who's able to offer support on that front. And throughout the session today, all of Shareable staff has our uh, fancy pizza emojis at the beginning of our names. So feel free to touch base with any of us uh, through private chat if you would rather do that instead of doing it in the group chat. So um, without further ado, I'm going to pass it to Jen and Barrett. Hey, folks, let me... Uh share my screen really quick all right can everybody see that okay yep. awesome um well hi um like tom said today shareable is all about education place in your lending library and how uh, this type of complementary program can benefit your organization and the communities you foster um, so, oops, here we go. Our plan today is to talk about the whys and the hows of running successful uh, classes and workshops. So why have education and um, what's important to think about before making the decision to run this type of programming and then how to do it. Um, so, as, and we're also gonna consider some other specific um, constraints that your space might have, um, which may uh, lend itself to you running certain types of education. So our goal for this presentation uh, will be to help you piece together the puzzle of running supplemental programming in your respective spaces. Um, just a little bit um, about us before we get started. Um, my name is Jen. I'm one of four directors at the Station North Tool Library here in Baltimore. Um, we've been around for about 10 years now. Uh, we actually celebrated our tenure last year, so 11 years. Um, I've been involved here for about eight years. Um, I've been on staff for three years now. And before that, I was a volunteer and a teacher. Um, I have an art background, um, namely in sculpture. And I've dabbled in like other mediums like woodworking, metalworking, textiles. So this has given me a pretty good background on how to conduct multidisciplinary classes at the library. Um, I manage um, 30 plus teachers. We run about 30 plus classes. Um, depending on the season. Um, 
And these classes cover a breadth of skills like woodworking, crafts, knife making, and home care and garden care. Hi, I'm Barrett. Um, I'm the education coordinator at the Seattle Reconomies Tool Library. Um, I've been working here for about a year and a half. I started as an intern through my university and then was hired on after that. Uh, I manage volunteers who run uh, the workshops and teach classes as well as or uh, coordinating our educational program generally and running ships at the library itself. Our programming is much smaller than the Station North Tool Library. Um, and it's made up mainly of introductory classes and things like woodworking, gardening, sewing, bicycle maintenance, and home maintenance. Um, so the first thing that we're going to be talking about is the why of education. So what these additional programs can bring to your community and thinking about what parts of your community may need these programs and what the benefits may be for your community in general. Something that we'll talk a lot about in this presentation is thinking about your own community needs and making everything that we talk about here based off of your community and your space, because it is very individual. Um, so the benefits, uh, there's a lot of benefits of educational programming um, for the community in general. First, there's a lot that you can gain by the safe usage of tools by providing the space and the knowledge about the specific tools that may or may not be a part of the lending library itself. This can work hand in hand with your library by getting people to use the tools that they may not have used without the classes and allowing them to tackle projects that they may not have attempted without them. Um, in increasing this access to knowledge, there can be a great increase to accessibility of tools. Programming can also often reach a new demographic of people within your community and bring new members into the library itself. Folks may who may not have um, needed to borrow items without the classes now have gained skills and may decide to become members and continue using the library after the classes. Um, and also workshops can be a fun and good gateway for people to like interact and learn about the sharing and reuse economy. Educational programming can also build community. Your library can become a third space for many members of your community to explore outside of their work and home. Programming brings people together with shared interests and literally together in a shared space. Many recurring class takers can become advocates for your organization and bring in more people to the tool library. And a huge benefit is that the community can build resilience through sharing of skills and knowledge. As well as a personal level, there's a huge benefit on class takers on gaining confidence and skills. And this can be especially beneficial for users who might have marginalized identities and might not feel as comfortable in some of these very tool heavy spaces. And there's also the additional um, income that could be brought into the tool library, which can help you grow um, your programs and, you know, build staff hours and um, increase a revenue stream for the library. Um, some challenges. Oops. Some okay. challenges of um, the educational programming. Um, we wanted to mention these before we get too in depth into the um, presentation, just because there is a very big um, time and space commitment for the tool library. Um, and you really wanna consider this before you start getting too into it because it, it can be difficult to do. Um, so there's a physical space that needs to be set up um, and to have these classes be feasible. Um, and this may be having a dedicated workshop or a multi-purpose room that can be altered to make classes work um, and a space where the materials and tools can be, um, can live and can be accessed. Uh, we don't wanna deter you from thinking about educational program, but we did wanna bring this up before we got too far in. <clears throat> cool. Um, so a big component of determining whether or not you want to develop educational programming in your space is understanding the need that you might be filling, um, specifically understanding what your community needs are and how best you can meet them. Um, 
This all happens through a process of assessment. Uh, this may seem obvious, but implementation of assessment is always more work than you plan for. So it's good to think about these things strategically. Um, some methods that you can use to understand your community are assessment through borrowing trends. Um, can you identify and provide education around tools that your community deems valuable already? Uh, for example, does your lending library uh, lend out a lot of one type of tool? Maybe it's gardening tools, maybe it's renovation tools or auto tools. Uh, if so, and you've identified those, maybe you create education around these fields. Um, another nugget of information that you can gather from lend the lending side of your organization is whether or not tools are coming back in good con working condition or not. Um, and if not, maybe um, there is a need for more education on how to use those tools properly. Um, also assessment through surveys. So surveys are really quick, a quick way of, um, of gathering lots of demographic information about your members, like housing status, income averages, and general interests. Um, and these can help you understand what types of programming that might suit best suit your member population's financial, cultural, and housing needs. Um, an example of this might be like renters uh, might want a wall repair class so they can get their security deposit back while homeowners um, need home maintenance um, tips and guidance. Uh, gathering employment info also can help you understand the best timing um, for your classes while also giving you an idea around what your members can actually spend on taking classes in your space. Um, and one thing I wanna mention here is that Surveys are pretty fast and easy ways of compiling information, but they may not always give you a fully representational picture of your member pool, especially if um, the surveys are optional. Um, so frequently asked questions are another way to gather educational needs. Um, if you're getting emails asking you certain types of uh, questions about tools or practices that lead you to believe that knowledge is lacking in certain fields, maybe that's um, where you, you focus your efforts. Uh, if you have a public workshop um, and people tend to ask similar questions around the space or techniques, um, you know, you can, you can address this and cut the labor of answering the same question over and over again, and instead design curriculum around that information so that you can make sure that um, it's being delivered succinctly and consistently to your members. Um, and then the last one that I want to talk about is um, just good old fashioned talking to folks. Um, so obvious pathways for education may emerge from you getting to know your community. Um, maybe you learn that a lot of your members bike to the library. Um, and so there may be a need for a bike maintenance class, just as an example. Um, so not only does this help you build stronger community by investing time and energy into knowing who you who your members are, but it also um, may open up opportunities for communication that may not have been opened up by just survey surveying or being responsive to emails. Um, so we're going to talk a little bit more on like people power talking to folks a little bit later, but it's just really astonishing, like what information you can gather by prioritizing these connective conversations. So the next thing that we're going to be talking about is mission driven programming. It's important to consider your organization's goals, values and mission when you're starting out with this process. Having a good understanding of these things will help you make decisions on what should be included in these additional programs, who you are, what your values are, and what your value is to the community. So what is mission-driven education and why is it important? One of the most important things is to like really focus on like who you are as an organization and what your goals are with these programs. Um, so good first step, determine your goals. Um, like what's your, what's your mission and how is education gonna play a role? Um, being clear about this is, is gonna help affect workload capacities of the staff, um, the impact that you're doing for the community and the processes that you're gonna use. Um, so is it a goal for you to run the organization purely off volunteer power? Maybe offering supplemental programming isn't going to be the focus of your organization unless you have a volunteer who's really dedicated to this process. Or maybe there's some one-off classes that volunteers can run on their own. 
is it a goal for you to increase your income? Maybe this may impact um, what type of classes you prioritize having and what size they're able to be. Is it a goal to break down barriers of tool knowledge and for marginalized people? This may impact your marketing and your student pool. Is it a goal to create a collectively led and operated space? This may impact the processes that you have for onboarding teachers and the systems that are in place to make, create new classes. Is it a goal for you to organize and value labor? Um, this is gonna impact the instructor pay and the staff pay. Is it a goal for you to spread knowledge about tools and home improvement? This is a good determiner of if classes are the right thing for you to do as an organization. It could also be a goal for you to have classes to be free or heavily discounted. Maybe applying for grants or other educational programming funds would be a good idea. There's many ways to have educational programming fit into your goals as an organization, but considering how these are gonna tie in and will make it more clear on what your priorities are going to be while creating these programs. Okay, <clears throat> we're gonna talk about money a few times in this presentation, but here's the first one. Um, so it is important to consider the makeup of your organization and what education's role might be in the sustainability of the organization's overall budget. Um, so to know this, you first need to decide on how you are gonna financially support this program. Um, so do you wanna make money um, with this program? Like Barrett mentioned, that might be one of your goals. Um, or do you want this program to offset other costs of running your organization? Um, do you want your program to be self-sustaining? Uh, self or do you want it to be free to everybody? Um, this option, like, like Barrett was mentioning, you, know, you might need to receive grant funding to run this program um, or another program at your organization needs to um, be able to subsidize this. Um, do you plan to offer sliding scale payments or donations from students to finance this program? Uh, with this option, messaging is also super important along with having an additional funding source since predicting revenue is like nearly impossible. So with any of these choices, there are pros and cons and a lot of considerations to understand before committing to how you wanna run your program. And again, values and mission tie into this decision a lot, and they may even decide your program's financial structure for you. Okay. Sometimes this doesn't work. Oops. Okay, sorry. Um, okay, so hopefully now you have an idea around how education might fit in or benefit your organization. And I apologize if there's some sound, there's a wood shop next to me. Um, but yeah, so now let's talk about the how of education. Let's talk about the recipe um, to make educational programming happen in your space. Um, and before we get into it, uh, it's important to note that you might build out your educational programming differently than other lending libraries. And that's okay. All of these ingredients are variable depending on your capacity. Um, we do recommend that you consider each one an important player in creating uh, a sustainable and successful and impactful uh, program. So we'll get into each of these individual ingredients, but just so you can see the whole before we get started, um, these are the following things that we think make up successful workshops. Um, after, of course, you figure out what your community needs are. So there are people, the curriculum, the space and tools, um, student management systems, assessment, and of course, uh, capital investment. So people, as you may have guessed, are maybe the most important part of this recipe. They're the reason we're doing this and also the reason that we can do these programs. For the programming side of things, people can come in many forms. Um, there are the instructors. These are the people who are actually running the classes, staff, which can fit in in many ways, um, and the many support roles that go along with these programs. Um, how instructors interact with these programs can look many, many different ways. They can be paid staff, volunteers, contractors. Each of these roles can be very variable, or it can be a very viable option. Um, but they each come with some considerations. For volunteers, there might need to be incentives for them to teach or strong systems in place that make it easy for them to get involved. 
If they're paid staff, you have to consider the amount of working hours and budget that you're working with. And the same goes for the contractors, as well as thinking about tax considerations that might go along with hiring contractors. You also have to consider the roles that the instructors are going to be playing in the logistics and operations of classes. They can be split in many ways, anything from handling everything for a class, from scheduling, creating sign-up systems for students, gathering materials and teaching it, to just being teachers, and that's all they do or more likely some balance of in between the two, where they're collaborating with staff or other volunteers to work through all the logistical details. Besides the instructors involved with these classes, there are also the staff hours that will go into all the logistics and setting up classes and how things are divided among the people. Are there going to be dedicated hours for education, educational programming for your staff? The labor load can be very different depending on who you're working with and what type of classes you're trying to do. As an example, Seattle Economy has one staff member using about five to 10 hours a week to run a small education program. This includes setting up new classes, finding instructors, creating partnerships with other organizations, communicating with instructors, handling the class logistics like scheduling. Um, we have another part-time employee doing marketing um, which ties heavily into education programming. And almost all of our teachers are volunteers who facilitate the classes as well as run our workshop. In total, we run about one to two workshop orientations, a few um, open hours in our shop, and then a few other classes a month. Um, in contrast, Jen, do you wanna talk about Station North? Yeah, sure. So um, like I mentioned, I'm one of uh, <clears throat> four full-time staff. Um, and my role is dedicated to educational programming. Um, so my, you know, 40 hours a week is going into uh, writing policy, creating new classes um, and other educational programs. Uh, also onboarding com and communicating with teachers, handling class logistics and purchasing materials, handling enrollment and student inquiries and scheduling. Um, and then as well as uh, me working on that, I have another um, coworker who is um, maybe half of his time is also dedicated to helping classes run, like prepping class materials and making sure the space is up and running. Um, and then my other coworker maybe spends like, I can't really say a percentage, but um, some portion of her time doing budgeting for class related um, programs. So it's, it's, pretty it's a lot of us working together to make this happen um, but SNTL runs like a very robust ed educational programming um, and it's the biggest portion of our internal revenue stream so like I mentioned earlier it's um, I think at right at this point it's like 32 classes um, 30 plus teachers and we run classes almost every day of the week except for Fridays and Sundays Sundays we run open shop programming in our spaces and we tend to run, um, if we can get there, three classes each evening. So, you know, it's quite a lot of classes in one week. Yeah, so there can be a lot of different ways to do these additional programs from, you know, very small setup to a very large and robust system. Um, and not one system is gonna work perfectly for everyone's space and there's a lot of variability there. Some other roles um, that we kind of touched on already are the support roles. These include the marketing, like I mentioned, or graphic design for posters or different events, um, community liaisons between the community members and your organization, as well as other roles that deal with like logistics, operations, budgets, and all of those things for running the programs. Um, there's a ton of invisible labor within the scheduling and all of the classes stuff. So really make sure there's enough people power to complete all these roles, as well as the work being divided in a way that makes sense for the workloads within your staff and volunteers. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so uh, this next slice of the recipe is all about developing curriculum for your workshops. Um, and so I found that the following model um, and the process or finding a model and a process is the best way to create classes um, so that all of your classes that throughout your organization um, feel cohesive to your members. Um, so creating a structure for your classes is the first step. 
Um, this will give you boundaries um, to work within and boxes to check as you work on curriculum development. Um, your structural model may be different from other lending libraries, but they may include setting a length for your workshops and a time that best suits your members' availability and capacities to stay engaged. Um, it could also include identifying um, and designing classes to meet the uh, meet accessible goals uh, within that time frame that you've allotted. Um, this may mean that you might need to focus on only a few aspects of a broader topic. Um, or run workshops in multiple sessions to be able to accommodate complicated processes. <clears throat> um, designing the curriculum to create moments of interactivity uh, that allow many different types of learners to engage in the class is super important. Um, you wanna be able to meet the needs of all types of learners. So that might be auditory, visual, experiential learning. Um, this may mean creating activities that allow students to apply um, new skills towards a project. Um, uh, having teaching aids is always helpful and gives learners a lot of context um, or take homes that allow them to refer uh, back to for future projects. Um, at Station North Tool Library, uh, we have two types of classes that we offer. We host skill-based classes and project-based classes. And even in the skill-based classes, we try to work in some interactive stuff. But basically, students can learn concepts and processes in our skill-based classes, and then they can apply them in our project-based classes. <clears throat> um, accessibility is a, a big one, and it means a lot of different things. Not only are you designing curriculum that meets the needs of different types of learning modalities, uh, but you're also designing classes to be uh, accessible to folks who speak different languages. Um, you, need, you might need physical aids um, for people to participate and understand concepts. Um, and you need to think about, is your workshop space easy to navigate? Um, do you have proper wayfinding in place so that people can feel at ease while, while in your workshop? So identifying target audience, um, your target art audience, uh, this will inform the design, uh, the, the design of your curriculum even further. So are you tailoring to beginners who may need concepts broken down pretty, pretty far? Uh, this might mean that you focus those goals even smaller. Um, are you working with youth? This is something that takes a lot of figuring to make sure that you're both legally accountable for youth in your space, but also that you're creating valuable classes with youth brains in mind. Um, it's a whole can of worms. And honestly, we would suggest that you have a specialized person um, to work with youth, youth programming in your organization. More people power. Um, similarly, working with elderly folks presents other challenges that you might want to consider when you're designing your workshops, um, like maybe the classes are shorter or you, you make sure that there are plenty of breaks and that you have um, assistance for, for these folks. Um, similarly, working with folks with disabilities, um, so in, in that case, you may need to structure your workshop drastically differently um, to accommodate these special needs. Um, another thing to, uh, to consider is how does your curriculum get written and how does it get tested? So this relates again back to people power um, and having capacity to run this program. Uh, does a staff person write all of the curriculum and review it or do teachers do this? Um, or is it a combination of both like Garrett mentioned earlier? Um, so having a process and a template for writing curriculum will ensure the consistency in your program as well as define whose role is what and who is accountable for what. Um, you also need to consider how to test your curriculum um, and gather feedback. So at uh, Station North Tool Library, we run prototype classes before offering them to the public. Uh, these prototypes are uh, free and open to the volunteers of our library, which is a perk of being a volunteer. Um, and we ask that as they take the class, they provide feedback during and after the class so that we know how we might need to adapt the cur curriculum before we release it to the public. Um, and prototypes also let teachers get comfortable with the content and especially with the pacing of the class so that we know that it fits in um, within the time frame that we've, we've allotted for it. Um, the last thing that we'll discuss is uh, what systems do you use for gathering and preparing class materials? <clears throat> Another tie to people power here. 
Um, who is responsible for actually making sure the class is ready to run? So tools and materials will need to be gathered. Um, and there may be some amount of prep that goes into um, making sure that your students are set up for success, whether that's like making sure the space is clean and organized and all the tools run and the, um, the materials are prepped for them. So defining whose roles these are is really crucial to make sure that your curriculum is sustainable for your organization. Another big consideration is um, the physical space you're working with and the tools that are going to be involved for each of these classes. This is a fairly straightforward part of our recipe and is very dependent on, you know, your physical space and what you have available. But these are some things to think about as you move forward. Um, will the programs that you're going to be doing be on site? Do you have a space that can be a workshop or a multi-purpose space? What type of classes will be able to be there? How many people can fit into these spaces? Are there any lease considerations to think about, such as no automotive classes or a building capacity? Um, there also can be limitations based off your insurance. So just things to think about. Um, are there amenities to set up? Bathrooms, AC, slop stink, sink, parking. Um, if you're considering having on on-site classes, how can you create a space itself that lends itself to programming overlap? Can you have two programs going on at the same time or even have your lending library open as well? Having two programs running at the same time, whether that is the library and a class or two additional educational programs, um, this may give exposure to your other program to the attendees. So this can be done by just having people walk through one space to get to where their class is. Um, in addition to exposure, it may allow people to get more comfortable with this space and expand what classes they're interested in taking. Another consideration that I'm sure you're all familiar with by now is virtual events and learning. This can be many, there can be many benefits of virtual events and classes, especially when your space itself might not lend itself to on-site classes. Um, some considerations here are what type of software you'll use. Are they going to be recorded or open sourced? Um, what type of workshops will you be able to host on here? Um, you can also consider offsite spaces. So these can be public spaces or partnerships with other organizations that might have a space that's available for you. Um, and these can be a great way to like work around these space limitations um, and partnerships can also be done virtually. They can be used to spread the work that you're doing to new communities um, and that can be an added benefit of getting new members into your organization. And when you're considering using an offsite space, be sure to think about the intention around the location or the partnership. If it's gonna be in a public space, is there a fee or a reservation needed? Are you gonna need an offsite facilitator um, that's gonna be, you know, need to be communicated with? Will you need to bring certain tools or are they gonna be provided? Will there be consumables? Who's gonna be bringing all these things? All of this is to say, there's a lot of, an in, like how much of an investment are you gonna be making in these classes? Is it gonna be, a one-time thing, or is it going to be a class that you're planning to run a lot? And that can be a big determiner of like how much energy you want to put into it. Um, there's a lot of creative ways to get around space limitations if you don't have a like on-site spot that is available for these classes. Um, so just consider all these other options, and I'm sure there's more than this as you're going forward. Sorry. Okay. Um, yeah, once you have a location uh, and the resources and the plan or the curriculum um, for how you want to run classes, you also need to figure out how participants will be engaging um, um, and can fill the class or workshop that you're posting. So uh, there are tons of ways for you to go about doing this, but the three buckets to think about here are what interface do you use to host enrollment? How do you market classes and how do you provide support to folks who are engaging with your classes or workshops? Um, interface, um, this would allow participants to be notified about an event, they can sign up for it um, and potentially pay for the class. 
there are a lot of options again um, on what interface you might be using, but what you want to look for is, uh, is it easy for both a potential participant to use and is it easy for your teachers or other staff who might be posting the event to use? Um, does it have payment processing uh, if you plan to require some form of payment for your classes? Um, and with this, it's important to note that you um, you know any processing fees that might um, might come with this. Um, similarly, does this count, this software require a subscription to use? Um, if so, make sure your annual budget can hold that cost. Um, does the software collect demographic data um, or provide other analytics around member usage? This can be super helpful to understand the trends that inform your programming, and it can even connect you further with the members, um, with your members, and especially if you can see their journey through, um, uh, through woodworking or whatever their interaction with your organization may be. Um, at, at the tool library, at the Station North Tool Library, we use a program called MindBody, um, which is a software that a lot of gyms use um, to process both membership to the library as well as uh, post and charge for classes. Um, it's a little bit, it's, it's an expensive software and there it does a lot of things, but it also doesn't do a lot of things. So um, we're kind of in, the, in a moment where we're actually exploring changing softwares. But Barrett, can you talk a little bit about what Seattle uses? Yeah, we use Eventbrite, um, which has been a good option as we're kind of getting our um, education programming started. It is fairly user-friendly to use um, and fairly cheap, but we're also kind of in the process of also looking for other options. So we're definitely not like sold on it. <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of uh, tool libraries nationally use uh, sites like Eventbrite or Meetup. Um, some people use GiveButter um, to host enrollment. So yeah, lots of options, but you just need to find what works best for you and meets your needs. Um, so um, after you've posted your workshop, you can't really expect people to sign up for it without marketing. Um, so we all know the power of marketing. You've got to figure out how you can tell people that you have what they want, but marketing can be pretty complex and it's a huge time suck. Um, so when you're thinking about marketing, consider your brand identity, um, and this may sound overwhelming, but it's important that you present a recognizable and cohesive organization to participants. Um, and this might, might mean like having brand colors or a mascot or just a go-to style that gets communicated across all of your marketing. Um, along with that, having a marketing strategy, um, maybe not high level, but at least a general strategy that allows you to be consistent with your posting, uh, allows you to understand your community needs so that you can stay in sync with them, um, and to help you market all aspects of your organization while not overwhelming um, viewers with competing events um, or programs. Um, nobody likes to get too many emails. It's definitely something we work are working on here. Um, and then also you want to consider your marketing avenues. So do you send an email newsletter? Do you use social media? Um, do you have community outreach days or table at events, etc., or all of the above? Um, uh, a big thing to consider here again, like we keep saying, is the people power element. Um, you might need to hire somebody whose job it is to handle marketing. Um, maybe it's uh, you have a dedicated graphic designer um, so that all of your, your imagery can stay consistent. Maybe you have a social media coordinator or maybe even a community liaison who handles how your organization is being represented in, in, in public. Um, so along with someone dedicated to marketing, you also need real people to offer administrative support to your participants. Unfortunately, AI isn't quite good enough to know the ins and outs of, of your organization, um, enough to field every type of question that you will receive from, from your members. Um, answering emails is a big part of my day-to-day, -day, and I've, I've developed systems to handle like quickly answering these enrollment issues and questions about classes, et cetera, but you can never solve for the human condition, and people will definitely have, have a lot of questions. So as you're going forward with creating an education program, um, the next part of the recipe that we've kind of determined is the assessment component. 
We mentioned assessment a little bit earlier on how to determine what your community needs are in relation to education programming. But here we're going to be talking about the assessment of the programs that you've created and determining how things are going and if anything needs to be changed going forward. These are the processes that you'll want to consider while your programs are already up and running to continue to improve them and make sure the work that you're doing is paying off. Because of that, these are going to be ongoing processes that will never be perfect or done, but they'll always be informing you of the changes that the changing needs of your membership base. So a good place to start for these um, is to gather information from your community about your classes. And this can be in the form of, like Jen mentioned earlier, surveys. We do some post-class surveys, general surveys or open forms where people can submit questions or comments about our classes. These can give us a variety of information and might highlight some repetitive themes or questions that are gonna be um, coming up and maybe, maybe even easily addressable for, from us. Um, they can also be one-on-ones, um, which these can be debriefs after classes and these can happen with teachers or students. Um, and it can also be a part of evaluating teachers' performances. I know at Station North, they do an annual teacher check-in um, where you get feedback and, you know, you can give feedback and also get feedback from your teachers, which is probably a good way to, like, stay involved with your classes. Um, student retention is another good way to gather information about your classes, just seeing if people are coming back for more classes after they're taking one. Um, if you have programs where there's multiple steps, are people signing up for the first one and then the second one, things like that. It can give you information about like where your students are at and seeing if the classes are working for them. And as you're gathering all this info, it's good to like ask, have questions in mind and ask questions during it. Um, and then this can help you determine if you're meeting your goals that you've made for these programs. Um, these questions can be focused around like, how to adapt, grow, and sustain these programs, how to make changes that you want to make to the curriculum or changes to the system processes that you have, or how you're archiving these processes and how to create and archive more things along the way. Um, and once you've gathered your information, you'll need to measure the impact of the programs that you're creating. So measuring the impact can be really difficult and might rely on some of the processes of gathering information, like we just mentioned, like surveys or one-on-ones or things like that. But consider how these programs are impacting your community. And this can be, how are they leading to community growth and like what type of growth they're providing? Is it all individual? Is it more community-based, skill-based, things like that? Um, is there a direct community or personal impact? So are people using the skills that they've learned in the library and borrowing more tools from you to that include the skills that they've learned? Um, or are they wanting to share their skills with other community members? Like if people have been around for a while and signing up for orientations, now do they want to host open hours in their workshop or teach orientation classes in the workshop, things like that. Um, and a big thing is how are you going to measure these, these impacts? Um, this can be really complicated um, information to gather and you might me measure it in your membership demographics or a growth in membership in general, or perhaps in attendance to these additional programs. Um, like we mentioned earlier, you can use the data on student retention or feedback to help inform the impact that you're making and inform places that you might wanna consider making changes. Um, the last part of this kind of circle that feeds on itself is um, like, how are you gonna create the changes that you have determined that you might wanna do? Um, there is gonna be a big labor need for creating any changes as well, just as like setting up these processes is. Um, and who is going to be doing this? Is it going to be staff? Is it going to be volunteers? Is it going to be instructors? Like these are all things to consider as you're making changes. And who's going to be writing down all the processes that you're doing and all the changes that you're making to these? Um, and some other things to consider in the creating changes is just like, how are you allowing new facilitators to come on board and new instructors to come on board? Things like that. Um, 
you don't want to be repeating your work all the time. So it's best to like be able to write it down and have it very clear and concise for the next people who are coming on board. Okay, <clears throat> we're back here with money. Um, unfortunately, money is a big variable when it comes to the recipe um, of creating successful programming. Um, even if your hope is to offer free workshops, there's most likely going to be an initial investment um, when starting your educational programming. Um, but that being said, there's a lot of thrifty ways to steer clear of expensive classes. Um, so look to your values and to decide how money will interact with this programming. I feel like we're going in circles a lot with like what we talk about, but it all kind of feeds into itself. Look at your values. Um, what are your goals? What's your mission? Um, maybe you get grants to fund all these classes and staff time. Um, or maybe you charge for classes because you want to be self-sufficient. Um, a big consideration, again, is how do you value people power and how do you value labor? So your staffing structure um, may reflect that and it will inform you what your financial needs are. Um, so I just also wanna mention here that um, this recipe as a whole is variable and non-sequential. Many libraries have started educational programming without having all of the answers to these questions or all of the money to start to have their initial investment. Um, but we do recommend that you kind of, um, you consider all of these layers before uh, beforehand. It might lessen any double work that might come up or miscommunications, and it will definitely um, help you steer clear of ill-advised investments. Okay, so hopefully by now you have a bit of an understanding on how you think you might be bringing on educational or supplemental programming to your organization. Um, but we didn't wanna leave you just hanging there. So let's talk a little bit about action items. Um, so getting started starts with finding a need, like we mentioned, assess your community to make sure that your vision for educational programming matches what is needed um, so that your impact is both measurable and meaningful. So the next thing would be to find the people, um, recruiting teachers, staff, or volunteers to make that vision happen is the most important work. Uh, making sure that everybody is on the same page and believes that the, in the mission is also very crucial to your program's health. Once you have the people, um, now, is, now is the time to delegate tasks. So figure out who is holding what responsibilities and make sure that everyone has a manageable amount that they're taking on. Um, setting up clear lines of communication so that folks understand what is needed and how to work together. And then most importantly, um, start small and grow organically. Um, seeing what works and what doesn't is just a part of the process of creating this program. Don't overload yourself or others with every possible workshop that could be planned. Um, the, tool the Station North Tool Library, we started off with like three classes and we've grown over 10 years to now be 30 classes. And that's happened through all of the steps that we've listed above, mainly assessment, like knowing where our impact is and what is what else is needed from our community. Um, but it's taken us, you know, 10 years and many iterations of, of um, delegation of tasks to figure out how best to do this. Um, so thinking about where you might start, um, filling obvious gaps. So this may mean looking at the programming you already host and supplementing them with education. Um, so do you, do you have public workshop hours? Maybe you start with a safety class or some sort of space orientation for that public workshop. Um, this can also apply to tool borrowing. So if you're lending out tools that are dangerous or that um, have a lot of components to them, maybe some providing some education is valuable um, for your tool lending program. Um, you can also look outside of your internal network and partner with other like-minded organizations. This is a great way to get around the space constraints um, and build community resiliency. Um, for example, uh, partnering with second use stores in your areas around um, material resources and education may be um, a values aligned opportunity. I know Seattle, you guys do that. Um, and then we also have partnerships with um, architectural salvage stores in Baltimore to gather materials for classes. Um, 
you might also already be partnering with somebody. Um, perhaps you're a, a CSA pickup location for a farm um, and maybe that lends itself to creating education around that partnership. For example, like having gardening classes if you have um, a, um, you know, a partnership with a farm or have um, a really robust gardening community. So all of these are, are easy wins. Um, the key here is to partner again with values aligned organizations. So you end up creating an ecosystem that is beneficial to all the players involved. So your organization, the other organization in, in your community. Um, and finally, you know, we're all here to share resources. So we want to share knowledge as well. Um, talk to other lending libraries, um, share and receive institutional knowledge on how we have all got, gotten started and where we're all at now. Um, there is a new National Tool, li uh, Tool Library Alliance. Um, that's It's pretty new and they've been meeting once a month. Um, if you're interested in joining, uh, you can email me. My email will be at the end of this um, presentation um, and I can send you an invite to that. But it's been pretty valuable to just hear, you know, how other tool libraries function and, um, you know, what they use for different aspects of their of their programming. Um, and then we also have uh, running notes around past meetings. So you can even look back at other topics that you may have missed. Um, and then I can also offer uh, the Station North Tool Library has um, open source curriculum. So I've written and archived all of our classes um, and have shared them with other tool lending libraries or other libraries. Um, and that has been a really great way to connect with other libraries, but also I think could be a good starting place um, for, for new lending libraries, especially with new um, educational programming. Um, and then, uh, I guess that's all we have, <laughs> but if you <laughs> are, uh, interested in, in more about education, we've got a, a poll here. So maybe I'll hand it over to Tom or somebody. Yeah. Yep. Thank that. So I think, um, Candice is gonna launch the poll for everybody and thank you. Thank you everyone. Um, for joining us for this and and yeah i think that poll should pop up yep right now there it goes so this is a poll just to kind of talk about what other future sessions kind of related to what was talked about today um while you're filling out that poll uh also if if you have questions please do put them in the chat and i've got a couple just to start out i wonder if you could just go into um, a little bit of detail about some of the classes that seem to be working really well you know, that either have been, you know, are a lot of interest or you found that they're, um, you know, were income generating, you know, you talked about kind of um, designing the program in part to um, fill other gaps in the, in the organization and the work that's being done in the community. So yeah, is there, is there a great example of, of classes that have worked really well and, and helped to fill those gaps? Yeah, definitely. Um, I mentioned like a safety orientation, that is one of our most popular classes. Um, it's very basic. It's just an orientation to our shop space and it's a prerequisite for using our public workshop hours. And I think Barry, you guys have something similar. Um, yeah. Um, yeah, I would say ours is basically the same. Um, the orientation class is definitely our most popular and our most common one. And it's also a great place for people to start. Yeah, and then I'll also just add, um, we have a class, it's called Tools and Skills. And it's it's a really, again, very beginner friendly class that um, covers hand like powered hand tools. And it's a really good bridge to the tool lending library space um, because it covers a lot of the tools that you might borrow um, in that space. Um, those are like, I think for me, like the two that have the most impact um, because it reaches the most amount of people and it connects all of our programming together connects our open shop hours and our, our lending library. But then we also have very popular classes that are kind of niche fun projects that, um, that people are really into. So, you know, honing in on like a, a really nice project um, that a lot of people might want to make is, is also a fun and can be successful um, class. Mm -hmm. Got it. Thank you. 
Um, also just going to point out again with this poll, I'm going to leave it open for one more minute and then we'll share the results with everybody. So if you want to get an answer in there, um, looks like there's maybe about a handful of people that still have not answered who are eligible to, um, please get that in. So we'll close out in a minute. Um, my, I got kind of a related follow-up question is, you know, have there been any classes that you have tried or workshops that have really not worked or is there any, like what, what were the duds and, and why? It. Uh, for us, it's hard to say, you know, why something doesn't work. I, I think it, I mean, the ones that are very obvious to us are ones that um, just don't really make sense financially for us to run um, because maybe the material cost is too high, which makes mm -hmm. the class itself an expensive class for students. Um, and that could be a reason why it doesn't run well. But at the same time, we have classes that are you know, $250 and they're really popular because they're like a very specific project. It's our knife making class um, mm -hmm. or chef knife making class mm -hmm. um, that uh, does really well. So it's hard to say what, why things don't work, but um, yeah, there are definitely classes that we have run um, for a few years um, that, oops, sorry. Um, am that, I back? that was me. Oh, okay. Um, yeah, there are classes that we have run that we have stopped running because the enrollment was too low. Um, and I think we're still kind of trying to figure out why, um, other than, yeah, the obvious reason of cost or, um, or like, it's just too niche of a project. <laughs> I don't know if, uh, Barrett, you have any insight onto this. Yeah, I know we've had classes in the past that have been hard for us. I know we tried to do welding once and, and that was pretty difficult um, for the space and just the effort that had to go into it. Um, we've also had some classes that went well, but we probably wouldn't do again just because there was a lot of setup involved that um, was a little bit too much for us, as well as it taking too long. Like we had a, a table building class um, that went really well, except uh, it went like three or four weeks over the amount of time that they were supposed to do. So it was just like a lot of time for our workshop to kind of be full of small tables and things like that. Um, so there's definitely like a lot that we've tried that hasn't necessarily done great, um, but there's also classes that have done really well, except probably won't do it again. Got it. When we're at just at time right now, want to just give a one last call out in case anybody has any additional questions that I may have missed in the chat. Yeah, I have a question, uh, yep. if I can. Uh, one of the things that I'm really interested in about in terms of like classes with the tool libraries and stuff, and you made mention of it during the presentation, is like offering skills to the community that they can then go out and use like to make money and you know, turn their labor into more money. And we're in a rural area that's, there's a lot of unemployment and underemployment. So I was wondering if you could tell me about in, if you offer any or anybody out there knows of any of the classes that like people are using to like then go out into the community and start businesses or like do work or whatever, anything like that. Um, yeah, the tool, the Station North Tool Library has had a workforce development program in the past. Um, and it's something, it did run for, um, a bit, like maybe a couple of years. Um, and that was, it was called Surface Project and it had folks come in and learn woodworking um, to make like a lot of tabletops and countertops for local businesses like restaurants. Um, and um, some of those people did go off and like start working in, in the field. Um, but it was a huge labor lift for us. And at the time, we were a much smaller organization um, with uh, less staff power, I would say. Um, so, yeah, it was definitely a big lift. It was really um, like cool to see, but it only really impacted, you know, those couple of people that were in the program. Um, and in general, you know, I think what we have found is entrepreneurship is like a whole different um, 
skill set that we we are not really prepared to to offer classes around. It's um, something that other maker spaces do, and they provide um, yeah programs for it. Um, here at the Station North Tool Library, though, I think it's very beginner focused, and we kind of focus on people coming into the space and um, having access to these tools to then um, just enrich their own life, not necessarily their, you know, income. Um, but we do have people who use the lending library as um, a way to supplement, you know, if they're a handy person, supplement their tools for their business. So uh, I would say the lending library may be a little bit more um, focused on making things accessible for people who want to have businesses. Um, but the education, you know, it might get someone started on their journey to that makes them want to learn more woodworking and then open up a furniture shop. But um, I think it's hard, you know, it's hard. We're trying to be realistic around like what actual capacity do we have in playing a big role in somebody's, um, in somebody's, uh, yeah, like career path. Um, there's a lot of benefits to that, but I think there's also a lot of benefits to um, just life enrichment and like community building, um, which we do pretty well here. All right, thanks for that. Any last questions before we take off? And I'll say that uh, if you check in the chat, Candace has posted our survey, uh, the kind of post-session assessment survey. Uh, so if you just take a couple of minutes to fill that out on your way out as well, that would be helpful for us. We do look at that information every week and using it to improve this program and future programs as well. Any final final questions? Yeah, Claire. Yeah, I've got, I've got a quick one, actually. I was talking to, um, thank you, first of all, guys, really interesting, really dense, a lot there. Um, <laughs> let me think of, uh, um, I went to an event recently and they they just put a paywall up. They They had been asking for donations and they were getting a little bit of money coming in. Um, and this was the, the first time that they'd actually put a paywall up and they said they made, made they had more people join. Um, oh, and people were paying, were they paying more or was it that? I don't know, they, they just, they were absolutely dumbfounded by how much more money they had made. Um, so I just wondered if you, I don't know if, if there is a structure that has worked for you or yeah, uh, anything that you've noticed from your, you know, 30 classes, do you have different structures, pay structures, yeah. for different events? Totally. It's very interesting. We're also kind of learning that same lesson right now with, uh, we just started identity-based programming here and we're doing, we are offering it at a sliding scale at this point. Um, but we had kind of piloted the program with offering a free class. Um, and, uh, it was the free, it was a free tools and skills class for, uh, women, trans and non-binary people. Um, and, you know, we found that like offering it free meant that like half of the people didn't show up. Um, and then as we, um, you know, worked on developing this program a little bit more and we offered a sliding scale version of this class, it meant that classes like, you know, people actually were committed to coming to class one because they had to pay for the class. Um, but then it was really interesting to see like how many people actually paid the full cost of the class um, in our sliding scale language. And it's not, I guess it's not a true sliding scale because basically we had real costs and sliding scale costs and the sliding scale cost was half the half the price of the full, the real cost of the class. Um, and it was interesting to see how many people paid that full cost. Um, that's a really big um, thing that we're learning and trying to figure out here um, is how we uh, encourage people to like, you know, uh, um, pay adequately for what they, you know, we, our whole organization runs sliding scale and we, we generally give advice of like, think about your annual income and give us like this percentage of your annual income. The language we actually use for membership is like a dollar for every thousand dollars you make annually. Um, but that like limits a lot of our revenue generation because actually there are people who are members of the library taking classes with us 
that make like $200,000 a year and they're only paying like $50 for this class when they could actually pay more and subsidize other class takers who can't pay as much. Um, so it's like a, a balance, but we have found that actually putting up some amount of, yeah, paywall, I guess, like charging something for the class makes it so that people one, like come to class. Um, and then two, they have to make, if you open the option around how people can pay for the class, uh, it forces people in a good way, I think, to, um, to make an assessment of like how they're benefiting the project of the tool lending library and what how their privilege can actually impact um, their payment, um, which helps us make more money to make these programs continue to run. Yeah, I think we are kind of experimenting in a similar way um, where we're still working on a lot of the, you know, logistics of pricing our classes, um, but we do have a, a suggested donation that's posted. Um, that is something that we somewhat determined based of, off of, um, you know, how much we think the class, class is worth and also similar classes in the area. Um, but there's also always a, an option that is posted for people if they're like, can't pay for that, um, we can waive the fee and that's not a big deal, um, which doesn't happen very often, honestly, um, even though it is an option for people. Um, but I think there's definitely room for us to like grow in the in the sliding scale um, of things. Cause I do think people often would pay more than we are requiring from them. Thanks guys, really informative. And really interesting how kind of psychological it is as well to encourage people mm -hmm. to firstly attend, but then to pay what they think it's worth. Yeah. Thank you. A couple other ways that I've seen it done is that there is, um, you know, some amount of like there's an upfront cost. And then if you go through the entire program, there's some amount of like giveaways, like a tool or this or that, right? That is equal to or or maybe less than the cost of of tuition and so there is like a a cost and a, a cost and reward beyond just the class itself or the event or whatever it is um but there is a fixed investment from the participants to get through and uh, another way that i've seen is that uh, even for like free classes or something things like that where there's a there's a cost up front. And if you complete the whole thing, you get your money back at the end. And so then there's just another, another incentive for people to come through it. Yeah. And uh, Bill, love, love your idea about having some other non-monetary way of, of uh, contributing. So um, yeah. I don't know if you want to just come off mic and say anything. Yeah, what I was saying is essentially what I was typing, essentially yeah. what you just said. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that they, they pay for it up front because that is reduces your no-shows, which are a huge pain. And if it's free, people can sign up, but just give it a, you know, not show up on a whim. But if they have to pay something up front, but, you know, when they can basically, it can be different in, in how whether they just need to request or what what they need to do to get the the subsidy or or to get it for free but they get that either at the if it's a multiple part class they have to have a certain level of participation or do the post class review or something that mm -hmm. um concludes okay now you'll get your you know $50 back or whatever it was for depending on how involved the, the class or class series is yeah that's great. And I think of a, a kind of a hybrid, we just got my mind thinking about other things that I've seen is a, uh, you know, a list of like, Hey, this is, this is the cost of doing this. And these are ways to contribute, to make this thing a success, contribute financially. You could exactly like do some amount of promotion and have different ways uh, for people, and sometimes I've seen it like gamify, where there's point values for for different ways of of contributing as well. I'm not somebody that is um, 
inspired by that gamification for things. So I, I, I don't, when I've seen those personally, they haven't compelled me, but I've seen them a number of times to the point that maybe it's a sign that they do work for others. I'm not sure if anybody has an experience doing that kind of gamification. Yeah, I think there's a lot of, <clears throat> we haven't done any gamification here. I mean, we've made games that people can no. participate in, but we haven't made any of our um, like organizational structure gamified for folks that I can think of. Um, I think, you know, a really just powerful thing is really getting people to understand like what, yeah, like you were saying, Tom, like what are the real costs of running this type of program? Um, you know, I think when I would teach safety, shop safety to people and I'm introing them to the organization, a big thing that I talk about is just like how sustain, how we can be sustainable. And that is by people becoming members and by people donating during our annual fundraiser. And um, I think you like sell like what the library is and the resource, the like amazing resource that it provides. Um, and just people having a under a better understanding of the sharing economy and and how they can plug into it um, and how valuable it is to not only them but to their community um, people they might not even know. Um, so I think for us, what has worked is really trying to connect people together, um, both in like education around you know the things that we offer education in, but also education around like how they can make an impact through the tool library. Um, and, you know, what is it that like a dollar amount or is that um, even just coming into open shop and being a part of the community that makes projects here and inspires others and encourages their friend to take class. So, um, you know, it's for us, I think what has worked is really just like making people feel um, a part of our community um, to a point where they want to invest in, in us. Mm -hmm. I think whenever you can build in a sense of belonging, uh, you know, again, you said being part of the community, but that's that, that feeling of belonging and, and not just the feeling, but the actual opportunity to belong to something, um, then it be, it's, it's shared. You know, and and so it's uh, this is the the shared output. This is the shared experience, and then there's uh, can be a more of an openness for sharing the cost of making that happen. Any other last reflections or questions, thoughts uh, related to today's presentation or the libraries of things collab in in general? Well, I think we're going to wrap up. We're just at a uh, quarter after the hour. We've got one more session left of our kind of 12 session series. Next week, we're going to be focusing on how to work with uh, and within uh, public libraries when starting libraries of things. Um, and so what those partnerships can look like. Um, we have a presenter who is currently working for a public library, has previously started uh, a tool library. And we'll be bringing in not only those experiences, but also the information that she's gathered from a bunch of other um, public libraries that are that are hosting libraries of things, but also working with uh, independent libraries to uh, partner back and forth as well. So I think that'll be a definitely an interesting uh, information to find out. I mean, the longest running tool library in the United States was started in 1979 in, by, uh, in the city of Berkeley. And it was initially independent, and a few years into it, it became part of the municipalized library system. And the librarians are are that that work in the tool library are paid, uh, just like the librarians in the rest of the book library. They've been able to use um, city funds to be able to uh, build their collection, and so a lot can be learned. And it is definitely if you find a, a welcome municipality to to partner with um there's a, a an opportunity for longevity there as well so looking forward to seeing folks for our final session of the 12 and then starting in july we're going to be doing monthly sessions for the rest of the year um to be able to kind of start that's one of the reasons why we've been asking folks to fill out these polls about follow-up topics 
And we're going to be drawing from that to build out the, the kind of the curriculum for the rest of the year. So look forward to joining you next week and um, after that as well. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.